Right, I'll just do a quick introduction. Um, maybe some of you aren't from Harrow. Um, I'm trying to multitask. I'm just letting people in at the same time. Um, so this is a series of presentations that we're doing every couple of weeks um, that's linked to the Harrow Go Green competition. Um, it's something that Harrow Council is, is putting together um, and we're helping to deliver that um, this year. The idea was just to raise awareness about what people can do in their gardens, um, their workplaces to improve biodiversity and to improve the environment. Um, we're having some talks on uh, things like how to um, attract wildlife into the gardens. But this one is going to be talking about, um, I think, quite an important subject, which is reducing the amount of heat that people are using in their compost, whether it's in their gardening um, or if you're working um, in parks or reserves to try to reduce the amount of heat that we're using. Um, I'm not entirely sure, hopefully Catherine can update us on this, but um, I understand that the use of heat is gonna be stopped um, within the industry, uh, but it doesn't look as though that's happening anytime soon. And I know that in Harrow, it's actually quite difficult to get hold of heat-free compost. The vast majority in garden centers and suppliers seems to have heat in it. Um, but I will hand over to Catherine Dawson, um, who's from Melcourt, one of the um, biggest producers of compost in, the, in this country. Um, okay, right. I remember to turn the recording on this time. So I'll hand over to you, Catherine. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Simon. Are you, are you going to ask people to turn off their video? Yeah, sorry, in so if you can, I, as far as I can see, everybody's muted already. If you can mute yourself, that would be great. Um, if you want to turn off your video, you can do, but I think everything's working fine. So if you want to leave that on. Um, if you have questions, if you just want to pop them into the chat, um, we'll get through those at the end. So the presentation is about half an hour, um, and then that will give us plenty of time to go through all of your questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Sam. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. I just want to check, is my screen, can people see my first title screen? Yes, yeah. At this point, okay. I know from doing one or two of these that sometimes my speech gets ahead of my slides. Um, Simon's on duty to um, slow me down if I'm getting ahead of myself. So I apologize if I'm speaking about stuff that's not um, yet on the screen. So um, peat free compost, a manufacturer's perspective. What I'm planning to do um, here is, is very much from the Melcourt perspective to try and give you an idea of what's going on at, at industry level with peat free compost. It has been a very controversial subject um, for quite a few years now. Um, we've been involved in it right from the start, really. Um, so uh, using Melcourt as an example, I'm going to try and give you an industry-wide view of, um, of what's going on. Um, I will just introduce Melcourt, just because I know that um, a lot of people don't know who we are. And contrary to what Simon's just said, which is very kind, we're, not, we're far from one of the biggest in the industry, but we're uh, we slightly box above our weight because we're one of the few specialists. Most of the other companies are coming at it from a point of view of, of being peat producers. We've never dealt with peat at all. Um, and so we are a leader in, in peat freeze. Um, I want to cover what, what can we use if we're not using peat, what can we use? Do the alternatives work? I want to show you some examples and hopefully demonstrate that they do. Is there enough to go around? Um, is it too expensive? These are all questions that are constantly raised. Um, the responsible sourcing scheme, which you may not yet know about, but hope you'll hear about. And what, what can we look forward to in the future? So just a bit of background about Melcourt. We were formed as a company in 1983. We started off as a, a um, landscape products, mulches, soil improvers, that kind of thing, play surfaces. Um, we've been supplying professional growers since um, the, the early 1990s. Uh, we have a retail range, and then we dabble in other sectors, biofilters, and a bit of equestrian surfacing, um, reptile bedding, and, um, and poultry bedding, which is uh, wood chip sort of materials. 
We operate from a headquarters site in Tetbury in Gloucestershire. The, the large areas of white in that picture are the pallets all waiting to go out. Um, and we are a privately owned company. We have two major shareholders, the first being the owners of this sawmill up in Shropshire. This is one of the biggest, most modern um, uh, sawmills in the country. And if you see in the, in the bottom right hand side here, this is where the bark yard is and it extends over in this direction. Housed in this great big building here is a great big screen that goes from one end to the other. And that's where we screen the bark. Our other major shareholder um, is the person who owns this company up in Penrith. Um, they operate very widely across the country. They're also heavily into biomass production um, or biomass supply for the big biomass fuel power stations. And the point about mentioning this company is that they are the largest handlers of forest residues, forest residues being our main ingredient. And so we have very good access to our raw materials with this company, not only for now, but also with forestry, it's possible to predict what's coming in the future because obviously it's a long-term crop. So our links with this company are, um, mean that we have very good raw material supply and very good intelligence on what's coming for the future. Our raw materials, as I've mentioned, are all um, timber residues. Um, so the barks and the woods that we use are byproducts of UK forestry. Um, we import very little indeed. And the one thing about bark on a tree, um, one of the jobs it performs is to keep the, the workings of the tree, the wood underneath in good shape. And that means it has to be water resistant. Now, when we want to use bark as a growing medium ingredient, one thing we have to do is get rid of that water resistance. We have to make it more peat-like um, and uh, able to absorb moisture. And that involves um, large amounts of composting because composting breaks down that natural sort of um, water repellent that uh, the bark has. So as I mentioned, we started off in the supply of these kinds of materials with specialists, everything from the smart mulches through to the everyday. Um, and um, the, the growth, we, we forget nowadays, we sort of take bark mulches for granted, but in the 1980s, they were a new thing. And we used to sell massive quantities to local authorities who realized that the labor bills could be um, made much less um, because mulching is a, is a labor saving device when you're looking after large areas of um, planting. Another thing in the 1980s where peat was the staple ingredient, but um, one thing about peat is that although it's a very good growing medium and you'll never hear me say anything, but I've spent a, a working life trying to find materials to replace peat and it's annoyingly good at uh, being a, a, a compost ingredient. But when you've got a long-term crop like nursery stock, trees and shrubs, one danger with peat um, is that it gradually loses structure, particularly in these lower layers. If you haven't got good structure, the compost tends to hold more moisture um, and roots need air as much as they need water. Without that air, you get this root death from the bottom up. And so there was a massive increase in use of bark as an ameliorant for peat in the 1980s. It was something that allowed growers to produce plants with growing media, with growing media that were well aerated from top to bottom, nice root system. This is what you want to see. None of this um, mass of water sitting in these lower layers, which will um, kill off plants. And you'll have, you'll have heard often the thing that more house plants are killed by overwatering, and that is a lack of lack of air that's causing that. Then we got to the late 1980s and, and this happened. The first conference on peat, uh, on the peat debate to do with that um, was in December 1989. And in the early 90s, this is a very old slide now, these were some of the headlines that were in the horticultural press, um, peat really under fire. And that started to change everything. Um, and uh, it's been a long process. That's obviously, that's more than um, 30 years ago now. Initially, the argument was about habitat and biodiversity. This is not a very good slide, but it's a slide of a lowland raised mire, the sort of place that um, would be cleared for um, peat production for horticulture. Um, and although this doesn't look very inspiring, it's an it hosts an absolutely unique flora and fauna that you just don't get in any other habitat. 
Um, if you want to use that for horticultural peat, that's what you have to turn it into. You have to drain it, and obviously you have to remove all of that diversity that's in those um, upper layers. And that is where the argument started, loss of habitat. But increasingly, an awareness of the importance of bogs um, and peatland as, um, as carbon stores. A 15 centimeter layer of growing sphagnum moss on an active bog contains more carbon per hectare than a tropical rainforest. That's an ICU, um, an IUCN figure. Um, and um, it, it's, it's a pretty big statement. The other thing is in flood um, prevention, Def DEFRA government, um, they're really getting stuck into peatland protection and flood defences have become very important. The reason for this slide is just to illustrate, I don't, this is the Peak District. I don't know if you remember two summers ago, there's a little place called Whaley Bridge, which is just here. Um, and that place has a, has a reservoir just above it. And that um, reservoir, I don't know if you remember, the whole place had to be evacuated. That was because excessive rainfall was falling in the Peak District and falling down the rivers into that reservoir. The Peak District, having been um, a lot of time and energy gone into draining the peatland in order to make it more productive, they're now spending a huge amount of money actually closing up all the drainage, rehabilitating the peatland because the importance in flood defence has been realised. So there's this sort of multi-pronged thing as to why DEFRA particularly um, and the conservation movement is very much into <coughs> peat, um, peatland protection. Culminating in the 25-year environment plan that the government brought out in uh, two, two years ago, and a statement within that was, if by 2020 we haven't seen sufficient movement to peat alternatives, we'll be looking at further measures. And indeed, that is now what they're doing because they haven't seen enough movement in peat reduction in, in horticulture. So if we're not using peat, what can we use? So what are the properties that we're looking for? Ideally, a material wants to be renewable, and this is the one thing that peat isn't. In any, type, in any kind of real scale, um, peat cannot be argued that it's being renewable. A material has to be consistent, has to be available. We're, we're often faced with materials that people send us and say that this is a fantastic growing medium ingredient. Well, it may be, but if it's not available in quantity and consistent, we can't even begin to look at it. Preferably UK source for obvious reasons. And the last two, low in pH and low in nutrients means that an ingredient has a blank, it's a blank canvas for a manufacturer to say, right, if I want to grow this in it, I have to add this amount of lime, these amount of nutrients, but I might want to grow something more vigorous. So then I can add more nutrients. So if my starting material is a blank canvas, it gives the manufacturer much more flexibility and it becomes a much more attractive raw material. And if, if you look at this list, um, the only thing that peat doesn't have is the renewability. It is consistent. It is available. It can be UK sourced, although most isn't, but very much low in pH, low in nutrients. This is why it's such a hard act to follow. So what ingredients can fulfill that list? Um, the timber residues, bark and wood fiber, wood fiber being either extruded, um, high pressure temperature and stringing it out um, into a fibrous mass um, and composted wood fiber, which is what we do. Coir, which is a byproduct of the coconut industry and green compost. In our case, bark, in the, looking back to that slide with the, the horrible lack of roots, bark, the sort of bark we used to use with peat in order to ameliorate it, give it more structure, give it more air, was this chunky sort. Nowadays, the composted material, much finer, much more like peat. Um, our wood fiber is, is um, a very fine wood residue. Silver fiber is a name that, that, that we branded it, silver being Latin for, from the forest. It's a composted wood fiber. We can control it. We can, PSD stands for particle size distribution. Um, particle size distribution determines how water moves through the growing medium, um, how much water it's going to hold. So it's a very key part of a growing media design. And we amend it with nitrogen 
because you'll probably be aware that barks and woods, they tend to have this uh, capacity to remove nitrogen um, from plant available um, material. So we have to amend with nitrogen. This is what silver fiber looks like in production, great long windrows that get turned. And on a very cold day recently, um, the turning, you can see how hot these piles get. Um, and this is all that thing about breaking down that natural water resistance that both bark and in fact wood has a bit of that as well. So in doing this composting, we make the material ready um, to add the nutrients and um, other ingredients to make it turn it from an ingredient into a growing medium. Coir you may be familiar with, maybe not. Um, it's appearing in a lot of growing media that you'll find in garden centers. It is renewable. It's a very useful material if carefully sourced. It's very available um, up to a point. It's not, obviously it's not produced in the UK and therein lies a problem. One thing now at the moment is that with the pandemic, the container ships are all in places they shouldn't be because uh, um, international freight movement has been badly affected. So that's affecting the amount of coir coming into the country. It is low in nutrients and it's got a very good moisture holding capacity. We use um, a small amount of coir in our product because it's got a massive water holding capacity and it just works very well with our base ingredients. We buy it in in these compressed blocks um, that have to be watered to bring them back up to capacity. So it transports very economically because it's both dried and compressed. And a lot of people will say to you, oh, it can't be a good thing because it's coming all of that way. Actually, if you drill down into the, the, the fuel cost, if you like, in terms of carbon emissions, because shipping is, is um, on a relative scale, one of the lowest emitters per tonne per, per, um, per kilometre moved, the situation isn't quite as bad as you think, but I'll, I'll, come, to the, I'll come back to that. Um, the last of the four principal non-peat ingredients, um, I think it's interesting just to point out that there are still only four after 30 years. Um, there are only four that the industry is using in any quantity whatsoever. Green compost, the stuff you put in your green bin that then gets composted. It is renewable, of course, on, on a very short time scale. It can be a very useful ingredient if carefully sourced. It is available. It's obviously coming from the UK. Disadvantages, very high um, pH and conductivity. Thinking back to that blank canvas I was talking about, we can make this stuff work, but we have to amend what we do because there's already a lot of nutrient in there. Um, it's cheap, cheaper than most other ingredients, but only sensible up to about 30% in a mix. So it's limited. You can't just use this as a peat, a straight alternative for peat. There are other many other ingredients that, um, that, that people are looking at. A very interesting one is composted bracken. Problem with bracken is that it tends to grow in very inaccessible places that are difficult to harvest. But if it is harvestable, properly composted, it's a very nice ingredient. Minerals like perlite, loam, anaerobic digestate, wool, all of these things have been looked at, but none is being used in any significant quantity. The last one is real. Composted banknotes is something that early on in my career at Melcourt, um, we were sent some great big bags of composted banknotes that had been shredded um, and for all the world looked like as though they could have um, a possibility. And of course the story would have been absolutely wonderful. The marketing would have been a doddle. Um, sadly, the inks and things got in the way. Plants didn't like that at all, but we were quite sorry about that because that would have been quite fun. Lots and lots of testing has to go into turning these ingredients into growing media. Um, we do simple pH and um, electrical conductivity. We calibrate ourselves against um, what I would call a proper lab. This is the sieve system that we use to determine that particle size, you know, how many fines, how many coarse particles. This is how we check consistency. We do Petri dish germination tests and we have a trial site near Cambridge where um, I'm based. It's a nursery, but we have as much bench space as we need to do all the growing and trialing and testing. We do lots of analysis um, via a laboratory. Um, and as I say, we calibrate our results against um, the proper lab to make sure that our results have some at least bearing in reality. And if you get it wrong, you can get dire results. Um, and here we've got healthy petunias, 
um, on the left, on the right here, probably there's only one thing wrong with that compost. It's not one of ours, I, I'm very happy to add. Um, probably this just lacked nitrogen. And that's how easy it is to get complete crop failure, because if you're a grower and this happens, that is crop failure. And that's a very serious situation. So there is no substitute for all the trials, testing, um, always constant, all the time. So we did all of that uh, development work on our ingredients. And in the early 2000s, 2000, 2001, we introduced our professional heat-free growing media. Um, and uh, we introduced a range. And I'm happy to say that years on, um, this is a very successful range. And I just want to run through some slides to show you the sheer versatility. Um, and these are all completely peat-free growing media. This is Hillier Nurseries, so that's Martin Hillier, big nursery on the South Coast. Um, and they're raising trees in big containers. And here, looking back to that, that slide where the roots were dying at the bottom, in a big tree, very structural stability in your growing medium is really important. Um, because there's a lot of weight bearing down on that lower layer. So that's a very important feature um, of, a, of a good growing medium is that it can with, uh, withstand that, that weight. Standard nursery stock, that's choisia and hydrangea there. This is one of the biggest tree growers, uh, fruit tree growers in the country, Frank P. Matthews, one of our really good customers. And um, those are every one of them totally peat free. Lovely crop of hellebores. These are fern liners um, growing in North Wales, just illustrating the sort of root systems that, um, that we can achieve, all peat free. We have um, cutting composts, propagation composts. This is bedding plants. This is Darlington Borough Council, as it happens. Um, irises. And I'm just really trying to show you the versatility here. This is one of those um, nurseries that if you buy potted herbs in the supermarket, um, this is the sort of place they, they use bicycles to get from one end to the other of this of this glass house. Uh, massive, massive scale, but um, some very nice peat free basil there. So really, that's just to show the versatility. Um, it, there's been a lot of criticism that peat free can never be as good as peat and we would really take issue with that and I hope that those, that run of slides can illustrate that. Um, we introduced a retail range because the, the market was asking for it. Um, we use the same formula as our professional range because we reckon the quality had to be the same um, and that, uh, that range is out there. We've supplied the Royal Horticultural Society with our growing media for their professional use in the gardens for many years and um, they were then very happy to endorse our, our retail range as indeed we're very proud to get this um, at our headquarters in Tetbury we're very close to Prince Charles's house at Highgrove and of course he's very keen on organics and peat free so we supply them and as a result we were awarded the Royal Warrant but it, it's interesting, this Royal Warrant, you don't actually have to supply them for five years, but um, you also have to fill in a very detailed sustainability um, uh, questionnaire. So it, it, it's, a, it's a good scheme. It's just another, another product. So one of the big questions is, is if everybody turns to peat free, um, will the demand outstrip the supply? And on the wood side of things, and, and wood is proving to be one of the, the biggest alternatives to peat, we have the, the um, competing industry that is the, the biomass, the, the, the wood fueled power stations. And um, one facility, and there are nine of these in the country, takes up one million cubic meters of wood chip, which is about a quarter of the annual uptake of growing media in the UK. So you begin to see now, and that is a highly incentivized, subsidized industry producing um, green energy. Nothing wrong with any of that, but at the same time, the government is asking us to be peat free and our industry isn't um, uh, subsidized in any way. And we're having to compete as the price of wood has gone up and we're having to compete against it. Um, and that's a very live debate with DEFRA at the moment. Um, but the one thing about a biomass power station is that they cannot deal with the fine end of wood chip. 
They like the wood chip, but they don't like the fines. It produces too much ash and it's a problem. And of course, that's the very part of the, the wood system that we want. We want the fines. We're trying to emulate peat. It needs to be fine to hold enough moisture. And so some useful byproducts are arising out of the growth of the biomass industry. These things are very, very linked. That's what one of those um, um, biomass power stations looks like, and that they get through absolutely ton after ton of material. Um, this is just a graph to show you how peat reduction is going. And you can see from the figures at the top that in 2005, this industry in the UK used 3.4 million cubic meters of peat. It has dropped, but you can see very much that it's leveling off. Total being the yellow line, the amateur sector, which uses more than double the amount that the professional sector uses, also leveling off. Um, and this is why DEFRA is getting a bit hot under the collar about the lack of progress that the industry is making. Um, this isn't a terribly clear slide, but if, if the latest figure on this slide is for 2017, but the situation hasn't changed that much. So if we just confine ourselves to this column here, you can see how much more peat is in use. This is composted green waste, the orange one. This is the wood here, the yellow bar here and the bark there. Um, and you can see how nothing else really, there's coir, nothing else is making any headway at all after all these years. Another question that's often posed on peat alternatives is, are they more expensive? And, and yes, they can be. If you're a, a peat company, the factory would have been built next to the peat bog. Think of those South Yorkshire ones, south of Scotland. That's where the factories are. They're sitting on the peat. There's very little transport involved. Um, whereas uh, for an industry, say, like the, the wood industry, we're relying on that wood coming, um, you know, a few miles on a lorry. Um, but increasingly, the question is being asked that is peat being sold too cheaply? Are the environmental problems um, caused by um, harvesting peat um, actually not going into that equation? And this is something that DEFRA is looking at at the moment. Because of us being in Europe, their hands were tied when it came to things like fiscal measures, taxes, for example, um, um, or preventing peat coming into the country because most of it is imported. With, um, with the EU, they were powerless to do anything about that. They're not now and they are looking. But peat alternatives, a bit more expensive, but not, not um, deal breakingly so. And that's why so many growers are moving over to them. Okay, so um, I just want to tell you about the responsible sourcing scheme, which is something that um, the government set up a task force in 2011 to look at why peat reduction wasn't happening more quickly. What are the barriers to peat reduction? And one of the things, the um, projects that arose out of that task force um, was that we needed a scheme to look more closely at the ingredients that are going into growing media, because the last thing that anybody wanted was, yes, we've stopped using peat, but now we're using something that's got its own problems. So responsible sourcing is all about making sure that the materials that we're using are manufactured and sourced in a way that's both socially and environmentally responsible. So how, and this, the, the strength of this scheme is that the people who've created it have been from across the, the span of everything from Friends of the Earth, National Trust, um, RSPB, right through to the manufacturers and growers, uh, B&Q and Homebase have both been very involved on it, um, and the RHS. So it, it, it's a strong scheme because all sides of the argument have been involved in its creation. Everybody feels ownership, really, I suppose you could say. And the scheme works by uh, just using us, our bark as an example. We have, to, we have to look at our entire supply chain, which for us starts in the forest. We're sourcing from around 100 forests at any one time. We transport the logs by lorry to the sawmill. We buy from about 24 sawmills who take the bark off the log. That's the first thing that happens. That bark is 
transported to a processing site and then it's transported once it's finished to our manufacturing site in Gloucestershire. And so for every stage of that supply chain, the, right, the responsibility criteria that we have to measure are, are these. How much energy are we using to actually move all of those materials all that way? How much water are we using? Well, actually we use very little water. Social compliance, are our social conditions compliant? But let's think about um, India. What, what's the labor situation like there? If we're buying coir from India, are we sure of the social conditions of the people working in the factories? What are the habitat and biodiversity impacts? This is where heat doesn't score very well. Are we creating any pollution? How renewable is the material? Um, resource use efficiency is a posh way of saying how much waste is produced in the, if we're making this material for use in growing media, are we producing waste? Because that's not a good thing. Um, we, count up energy, we count up all of those um, usages of energy um, and then we get scored on the basis of how much energy we're using. In our case, going back to our factory in Shropshire, the fact that we've got a lot of solar power being created on the top of our uh, manufacturing building means that we can offset some of that energy because we're actually making it as well as using it. Which is, um, which is good. And this theme is trying to encourage good practice. Another example, how do we decide if it's renewable? And again, uh, it's this decision tree, is the material renewable at the same site within 100 years? Let's take peat, for instance. Well, it's not renewable within 100 years. Is it renewable within 1,000 years? No, it's not. It scores really badly. Let's look at green compost, renewable within 100 years, yes renewable at the same site within 50 years? Yes. Renewable at the same site within five years? Indeed, yes. So green compost scores really well. That's a very simple decision tree. Some of the others are a lot more complicated, um, but I'm really behind the scheme. And we will start to see labeling on packs that allows you, the consumer, to make choices on the basis of this transparency. And it's a transparency that the growing media industry has been very, very poor at. Some bags don't even tell you what's in, in the pack. Has it got peat in it? Very difficult to tell sometimes. We're also starting to look at new materials. And just as an example of that, um, this is a project that we're very involved with, backed by some government money, in fact. Um, this is sphagnum. There's an irony here, of course, that it's sphagnum. It's this, this is what peat looked like thousands of years before it became peat. This is being grown um, by a company that's specializing in peatland restoration. So they're actually growing micropropagated sphagnum and it's, it's being distributed on peatland that's been degenerated by erosion or for whatever reason. And again, a lot of public money going into regeneration of peatland um, with new sphagnum. But the other thing that's been found is that this material, when it grows up and it grows to about two foot tall, makes a very, very good growing medium. And we're involved in a three-year project developing that. Um, and it's, it's very effective here. We've got a trial from a while back. Here's a peak control. This is a little shrub called um, Caprosma. Peak control, and this is three different levels of sphagnum, fresh farm sphagnum in the mix. And it's uh, very, very effective. You can see there's, there's no difference. Here we've got some petunias. I don't really need to point out which is which because they're all growing the same, but the ones with the labels around the outside are grown in 100% peat. And these ones are in entirely peat-free medium with 30% um, of sphagnum in, in the mix. So that's very promising. I think it'll be three or four years before this gets into a bag of compost near you because the real challenge is developing the farming systems. This is going to be a field grown crop, um, but very exciting for the future. And I think the other thing we'll see in the future is more harnessing of natural properties. Um, anything that's been composted has a very diverse microbial population in it. Um, and that gives protection against disease. Here in the top corner here, we've got watercress. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen watercress in commercial production, but the seeds are grown very densely in modules out of the water. They're very prone to damping off because the density, as you can see here, 
is so great. This is 100% peat, and this is um, one of our growing media with composted materials in there. This one shows no sign of damping off. It will come eventually, but there's a full two weeks usually between these two um, situations. So this one is taking a lot longer to succumb. And the thinking is that the, 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 the microbial population in anything that's been composted is so diverse that it gives just natural competition. There are some specific antagonisms as well. And here we see the same thing in field uh, in broad bean. And this is even an aerial disease. Um, this is 100% peat. And this is actually got, this is a green compost based mix. And again, green compost, composted material, very microbially active, giving protection. And even now you can buy, commercial growers are using um, manufactured preparations of, of specific microbes, very similar to the ones that are found naturally um, in order to give natural protection against um, fungal diseases. So very, very interesting. And I think we'll see a lot more of that in the future. So just to finish, is change possible? These are some of the uh, comments that over the years have been bandied around about peat alternatives. There is no consumer demand. Well, that's not strictly true anymore. Um, there's no price premium to be had. This is what garden centers have always said. Well, our customers won't be prepared to pay the price premium. Again, that's beginning to wear away and I think we'll see peat prices go up. No real pressure from government. That again, really beginning to change. If everyone went peat free, there wouldn't be enough alternatives. Absolutely right. If it went and happened tomorrow, there wouldn't be, but things are changing and um, no commercial market likes a vacuum. So um, already we're beginning to see new materials coming along and um, the case against peat has never been as strong. So I think um, the, there wouldn't be enough alternatives if it happened this year or even next year, but that will change. Are peat free products as good? Well, I hope I've demonstrated that yes, certainly they are, they are indeed. So absolutely to finish off a couple of headlines uh, from our trade press recently, the first national UK retailer to go close to peat free. The biggest garden center group is going to stop selling almost all of its bagged peat composts by the end of 2021. That headline would have been almost unheard of even two years ago. So there's change happening in front of our eyes. The Irish peat board, owned by the Irish government announced in January, it's stopping harvesting peat altogether. And that they are one of the biggest suppliers of peat into the UK market. And again, that has sent some shockwaves through the industry. They've got enough for this year because they, they keep massive harvested piles um, in reserve, but that, that is having a far bigger effect than anything that our government is, um, is actually saying. So change is happening. Um, and uh, it remains to be seen how quickly, but um, certainly change changes afoot. That's me done. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there's some questions in the chat. I think some of the questions have already been answered um, a little later on in your talk, but I'll, I'll just go through these. Um, Mary was asking, what gas is released from the composting and does it contain particulates? Um, there are gases released through, through composting. They're not captured as in a, they're not measured, but I think you're right to raise it because I think it's, a, it's an environmental question that um, is beginning to be asked. So there, there is always a downside. I can't give you any um, figures, I think, um, green waste composting because of the rapidity of the uh, of the process um, will be one of the first to come under that spotlight but at the moment the, the benefits of composting are thought to outweigh um, any 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 disadvantages but I do think that it is something that um, that that will be more and more um, investigated but I can't at the moment give you any kind of um, guidance on you know, and is, is one material any better than another? But it is something that peat, of course, doesn't doesn't create that kind of emission. Um, these things are always, you know, how do you compare the, the environmental damage of harvesting peat with greenhouse gas emissions from composted materials? 
it's a difficult one. It's a politician's um, thing to answer, I think. Um, okay, and then a couple of questions about um, COIA. Um, how much are the local folk paid? And are there any health problems um, that they experience as a result of working with COIA? Um, not that I know of, but we, we, um, we only use companies that are audited. Um, the, the, um, the responsible sourcing scheme includes audits on, um, we have to answer very, very lengthy questionnaires on, on the, 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 the labor conditions. And we only buy from two, two companies that we know operate their own factory. A lot of coir is sold on the open market, so there's a lot of brokering going on, and we we really wouldn't touch that because then you don't know anything about the conditions of um, of uh, employment and 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 all of that. But again, you know, it, it is a good question. We our interest in the sphagnum um, is very much because I I would really like to stop using the coir um, for all sorts of reasons. Um, and that that one probably included because it's so distant. It's you know we can't just go and do our own checks very easily at all. Um, but we have good long term relationships with the people that we buy from. Um, but um, the sphagnum offers a lot of the same benefits. Um, and I think if it really gets off the ground in years to come, it will mean that not just us but you know the rest of the industry might be able to reduce its reliance on it. Um, do you think you're going to, if you're growing peat effectively, um, are you going to experience issues with marketing that product compared to? It's, it, I think it would be quite wrong to call it peat. Peat is, peat is the result of, you know, literally thousands of years of um, very, very specific um, water filled conditions in very specific environments. Sphagnum is is will grow on top of a peat bog, but farmed sphagnum is is not peat. But yes, it's the, it is the same material. But I I would hope that um, the story is strong enough to withstand that kind of um, criticism because that that would be misplaced. I I, I would add that with a sphagnum, um, you'll perhaps be aware that one thing that's being looked at is that farmers would be paid for environmental benefits as much as they would for crops. And one thing is is actually being paid to farm sphagnum, not to harvest it for growing media, but to leave it in situ as a, as a permanent carbon sink. Um, and so the, there are, um, you know, that, that is one of the interests in, in farming sphagnum is, is actually to leave it where it is as a permanent carbon store. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um... Right, there's a couple of questions from Mary, but I'm going to ask her to explain those, but I'll just cover a couple of other questions first. Um, Anita's asking, why do you think there's a wider uptake of peat? Why do you think the wider uptake of peat free has been so slow? And is it down to existing infrastructure and investment? The availability has been limited. People haven't been able to get hold of it. Um, I do think there's a legacy of poor products which I'm, I'm, I really hope we're not part of. But um, in the early days, if you remember 30 years since the start of the peat debate, some companies saw kind of pound notes in front of their eyes and, and brought products onto the market before they were properly developed. And actually that happened a lot in the professional growing world. And we're still fighting the legacy of that. You know, can peat, peat free ever be as good as peat? Because often it wasn't actually. So it's a, it's a real um, complaint. Um, and um, I think garden centres were caught up in that same feeling. Also, when peat free had less publicity than it's had now, I mean, Monty Don, there's hardly a Gardener's World edition without him mentioning peat free, which is great, um, but that didn't used to be the case. And so that the awareness um, was much lower. But the Horticultural Trades Association, which is the trade body for sort of all encompassing of all of horticulture, did some research a while back and they found that even gardeners who class themselves as very keen, their awareness about what actually is in a bag of compost was, was their knowledge of content was very, very low indeed. And it sort of illustrated that, that um, if you don't know what's in a bag to start off with, you're not going to start asking for 
for, for something that hasn't got something in it. You know, it, it, it's a lack of knowledge. I think the gardening public is getting far more educated in that now. Um, and certainly we as a company, we found massive, the, the, a switch has been turned in the last year with partly the board pneumonia, the Irish peat board stopping harvesting peat, um, but also the pandemic, meaning massive um, pressure on supplies of growing media because of the uptake in gardening and uh, people trying composts that they wouldn't have tried before and seeing, that, oh, actually, they're not as bad as we thought. In fact, they're actually quite good. <laughs> that happened. Um, OK, Lewis uh, is asking, he says he lives near to Harrow. Um, and as mentioned at the start, it's really difficult to locally source peat-free compost. What would you say is the best way to drive change? Ask in your local garden centre, make a fuss, try and point out some of the disadvantages of peat. We've, we've got a storyboard, a Corex board, you sort of point of sale thing that, that um, illustrates some of the reasons why using peat is bad. Having said that, um, as a company, we've tried to stay out of the political side of things because um, it is a complicated subject. Uh, and I think one of the problems at the moment is there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, don't use peat, don't use peat. But if everyone did stop using peat, there wouldn't be enough to, you know, two million cubic meters worth of, of peat has to be replaced still. Um, and that that's a problem. But but at local level, you can just lobby your local garden center um, or try and shame them into it um, or point out where they can get a very, very good brand. Um, and, um, you know, that's that's all you can do. We, we've got a where to buy on our website, although it's very difficult to keep it completely up to date um, because we don't sell directly necessarily always to garden centers. It often gets sold via a distributor, so we don't always know where it ends up. Um, but actual rattling their cage is locally the best thing you can do, I think. Yeah, we can get, I mean, in, in Harrow, we can get peat free, but it, it's quite often advertised. And then when you actually go, it's not in stock. Um, or well, that's what I found last year anyway. Um, uh, somebody else is asking about the origins of peat. Um, I understand some of our peat comes from Baltic states. Are they following yep. Ireland's lead? Yeah, no, well, no, it has done for a lot for many years. Um, Ireland is the biggest um, uh, source for us, or has been. Um, and the Baltic states, all for Estonia, Lithuania, Finland, have been have been very big suppliers. The peat itself is slightly different. Um, it tends to be much younger and a bit spongier. Um, not necessarily quite so easy to use, but it's used a lot in the professional world. Um, some comes from the south of Scotland, a small amount from England. There's still some peat harvesting in the Somerset levels. Um, and um, there, the, the Somerset peat producers got themselves together and they've, they've been very successful in demonstrating that they've taken a lot of the peatland in Somerset went from agricultural land, in other words, land of fairly low biodiversity value into being harvested for the peat that was underneath, then put back into wetland. In other words, a net gain in biodiversity. However, one of the arguments of the conservationists is that a wetland is not the same as a lowland raised mire. You you've, you've, it's better than agricultural land from a habitat point of view, but it's not hosting the flora and fauna of the unique flora and fauna of a lowland raised mire. Um, I'll, um, okay, there's another couple of questions. I'm going to get um, Mary to unmute herself in a minute and then she can ask those directly because I, I don't quite understand. But um, what I was going to ask was whether or not you can recommend a way of testing um, compost. I found that some of the brands that you, you can buy are extremely variable and um, you might be buying the same type of compost from the same manufacturer or same supplier 
um, but the results are completely different. And it seems as though the structure of the compost is, is different as well. Is there any easy way of just checking it? I mean, would you recommend a particular plant that you could grow just to try it? Um, it's particularly for young plants, I'm thinking, and also um, seeding. Um, I think consistency is a problem, can be a problem. Um, and it is harder to produce a consistent peat free than peat, peat is, as, as I said earlier, it's sort of irritatingly um, easy, really, to grow things in and to, in, and to handle from a manufacturer's point of view, or I, I would imagine. I, the only thing about peat is that structurally it breaks down quite easily if you, if you handle it, if you screen it, it can break down. But, but essentially it's quite easy. Um, the, the inconsistency of some products would be down to lack of sort of process control. Um, to know whether it's going to work well, just anything that'll grow quickly, but in, in the winter or, you know, this time of year is when you want to know your answer quickly because you're about to sow your tomatoes and your, all the rest of it. Um, we're just coming into that season and to try and get an answer quickly, I, I guess a, a tomato is as, as good as you'll get if you've got indoor conditions. Um, but um, we use radish as a as part of our QA that that germinates very quickly with it within a week at temperature. You can get a good response from radish. We, we actually we do it in petri dishes and we measure root lengths against a, against a, a control. Um, you might not want to go to that degree, but that um, if you keep that at a good sort of, well, even 15 degrees, but if you kept that at 20 degrees, you'd get an answer um, and you'll very quickly see whether it's going to thrive as a seedling. So that that's probably one you can you can do. We, we do a lot of um, broad bean because it's a good uh, detector of herbicide residues, which we don't get herbicide residues in in bark or coir, but you can get it in green compost. And we use a bit of green compost in our um, some of our landscape products. So that's another one that will germinate quite quickly, even in the winter and grow in the winter and give it a little bit of heat and protection. Um, but I, I think your press, lettuce, anything like that is a good indicator to give, to give you a quick result. OK. Um, Mary, do you want to unmute yourself and just ask your questions about um, pH particularly? I, I think you've actually um, answered already um, that question. That's, that's fine. Thank you. OK. It's right. interesting. Thank you. <laughs> um, Gerald was wor worrying about the black cat, but no, she's fine. <laughs> I hope it's um, not a bad omen. No. <laughs> <laughs> or a bad omen for peat, maybe. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've actually used the, the silver grow for the first time last year, and I, I have to say it's worked really well. Um, the one thing that I really noticed was that it worked brilliantly in, in hanging baskets um, because it seems to wet much better than particularly the cheaper multi purpose compost. Um, you get this problem where when you water a, a dried out hanging basket, it just runs over the edge. Whereas with um, this peat free multi-purpose, it seems to wet much more easily. So I don't know if that's just the structure of the, of the bark or, but yeah, I've, I've had really good results with that. I, I, I would say bark can be as bad as peat if it gets really, really dry. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but the, the trick is with any of these things is, I know we all do it, we all get that, you know, sunny, windy day thing, but, but, but if you can avoid it getting really, really dry, if, if you ever get to that stage with any compost, just a drop or two of washing up liquid in the, in the watering can, just breaks down the surface tension um, and is perfectly safe. Um, we, we put wetting agents that are based on very similar things, detergent in, in the growing media to start off with, that's common practice in the industry just to help with the wetting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, um, we're just approaching half past eight. So, are there any other questions anybody may have? 
Okay, well, if not, thank you very much, Catherine. Um, thank you. I know that these these products are available in Harrow. I mean, you just really have to search them out a little bit. Squires definitely do them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, it would be nice if particularly people in allotments were adopting peat free. I think they're probably the hardest people to convince because um, they're quite traditional in, in, <laughs> in their ways. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Um, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye. Bye. Cheers.